Good morning, and welcome to our worship service. It's always a joy to be able to, to gather with you online. Today is June 14th, and summer is almost upon us, and I know this summer doesn't quite look the way we had hoped it would, but we are glad to be able to be together anyway. I invite you now to join me in the call to worship. Please join me at home. It will show on your screen. People of God, who do you come to worship? We come to worship the one true God. How will you worship? Not with words alone, but by, the living, by living lives of justice and love. Come, you who belong to God. Come, you who are foolish in the eyes of the world. On this day, let us worship together. I want to invite us into a time of confession. Um, I don't know about you, but I think one of the things that I have noticed as we live into this pandemic is that, um, is that our nerves are a little more raw than usual. And so perhaps this week we're all been guilty of saying something we've regretted, taking an action that we wish we could undo. Confession is always God's way of reminding us that his grace is sufficient and that we can start over. And so I invite you now to join me in this time. Let's bow our heads together. Let's, let's share in a few moments of silence and offer our private confession to God. And then I'll bring us back together with our prayer of confession. Would you bow your heads with me now? Oh, gracious and loving God, forgive us for failing to understand and accept the great demands placed upon us by your love. 
We enlist in your causes, but find ourselves losing interest. We promise to be courageous, but find ourselves afraid. We want to be sensitive, but find ourselves hard and callous. Forgive us. Take our limitations and turn them into possibilities for service. Have mercy on us and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news this morning. Our Lord's power is unequaled. His grace is unrestrained. His strength is steadfast. And his embrace is sufficient to carry all that we are and hope to be. Accept and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. Would you join me at home in, at home in singing the Gloria Patri? This morning, I want to invite you to turn with me at home to your Bibles, and let's turn together to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 9 through 17 this morning. As always, let's open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to the Word of God. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given you, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Thanks be to God for his holy word to us this day. This morning, I would like for us to spend some time thinking about foundations. I doubt I need to spend very much time convincing you of their importance. If you have ever lived in a house that has a poor foundation, well, then you already know the problems that come along with bad building practices. Sometimes these problems don't immediately present themselves, as they say, Caulk and joint compound can cover a multitude of sins. Eventually, however, seams crack and gaps start appearing as your house settles down around you. So what do you do? Well, some of us just ignore the problem. 
that's by far the easiest thing to do. We, we learn to live with these issues and, and have discovered that even over time we can, we can become blind to them. We don't even see them out of sight, right, out of mind. Many of us keep applying caulk and compound. This by no means fixes the problems, but it at least looks better for a little while, which in turn makes us feel better for a little while until, well, you know, the cracks inevitably show back up. It also wouldn't be unheard of to, to move. Now, this may sound a bit radical, but... But, you know, we all get tired of dealing with these ongoing issues, and so we make the choice to let someone else deal with them instead. And then there are the few. In a few rare cases, we acknowledge that there is a problem with the foundation, and we make the extremely difficult decision to tear down and start over. It's exhausting. It's uncomfortable. It's everything we generally try to avoid, but deep down we know that it's necessary. Foundations are just that important. For the next three months, you and I are going to be studying together the, the first and second Corinthians. And, and so I think it's important as we live into this time that we we spent a little time today putting in some groundwork for what lies ahead. And there are a few really important things that I, I want you to be mindful of as, as we begin to explore the Apostle Paul's words to the church, church in Corinth. And the first thing is this. I think it's important for us to remember that First and Second Corinthians are more than two books of the Bible. They are two letters, personal correspondence, that Paul wrote to a church that he helped found. Paul knew these people. He loved them. And he wanted to offer them some guidance. There's no doubt after you look through both letters that he had their best interest at heart. And so rather than choosing to ignore the issues that they were struggling with, he, he chose to address them. He addressed them because it threatened not only their own personal growth as Christians, but it, it threatened the, the Christian community itself. So when we read them, as we will over the next few months, we need to read them with the idea that they're both deeply personal as well as deeply practical. The second thing to keep in mind is the setting itself. Corinth was a really cool place. It was a, a booming commercial crossroads that was strategically placed at a major east-west trade route, and its claim to fame was it had two separate ports. And so as a result of this unique geography, people from around the world were always pouring in and through the city of Corinth. It was also located just about 50 miles west of the Greek capital, Athens, and as you know probably from your history, there was this growing philosophical movement that would, would tremendously change how people looked at, at thinking. And, and so human intellect and rhetoric were, were lifted up as the path to enlightenment for all. Naturally, this influenced Corinthian culture. And then there were shrines and temples. And just about any kind of sacred spot to a little G-God you could imagine, Corinth was filled with them. However, at the end of the day, the city was defined by the same things that still define cities to this time. Essentially, economics, power, and position were everything. These things were the foundation for the life of the average Corinthian. That is, until Paul introduced them to Jesus. The third thing that we need to know is the reason Paul wrote the letters. Paul's method for sharing the good news of Jesus was simple. He, he moved to an area, he, he worked and he lived in it, he got to know people and in turn people got to know him and in the process he began to share the good news of the gospel with them and together 
Together they began to build a church. Not necessarily in the formal structure as you and I know, not necessarily a building, but they formed a community that was committed to following the ways of Jesus Christ. After he had done this, he moved on. Well, apparently some problems, some major theological misunderstandings arose in Corinth after his departure. Word of this made it back to Paul, and so he he wrote two letters to address, correct, and encourage the Corinthians as they continued to, to seek to grow in their faith. In the weeks to come, we're going to look specifically at at a number of these issues. The fourth thing to keep in mind is perhaps the most important. When it comes to Paul, we must always understand that everything, and, and when I say everything, I do mean everything, begins and ends with Jesus. Paul is very much aware of the challenges of living in this world. He knows how easily Christians are influenced by their surroundings, and he's aware of how deeply ingrained our, our upbringing is within us. He, too, struggled with the inclinations of the heart that, that lead us to say things we shouldn't or to do things we shouldn't. And because of all this, Paul Paul's answer to all of these things that you and I, I mean, we deal with to this day, his answer was Jesus. Today's lesson is a perfect example. Per Paul, there's only one true foundation in this world, and his name is Jesus. This is the same beautiful truth that many of us have sung on many a Sunday when we were able to be in the sanctuary. You know the hymn. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. There's a reason Paul starts his first letter to the Corinthians focused on Jesus. Foundations are important. It may feel a bit redundant to re-emphasize this again, but if you don't have the right foundation in your life, then you're going to have problems, guaranteed. There are going to be issues. And the issue that, that Paul needed to address with the Corinthians can be summed up in one word, division. They had become a divided People. They had become caught up in that age-old battle of them versus us and you versus me. And this division took many forms, but in every case, the result was the same. The body of Christ that they had worked so hard to, to form and to build up was torn apart, torn down. The unity that they loved, enjoyed the fellowship. It was being divided. All because the Corinthians were unknowingly standing on a foundation other than Jesus. Bear in mind, they all thought they were standing on the right foundation. We read about this last week. Some claimed to belong to Paul, others Apollos, and still more Cephas. And Paul's response was to ask, has Christ been divided? Of course, it was a rhetorical question. Paul had taught them the truth. And now he used this letter to point them back to it. There can only be one sure foundation in our lives, and it is the crucified and risen Jesus. If we stand on anything other than that, there are going to be problems. Why? Because foundations are important. There's a reason I wanted us to think about foundations together this morning. There's a foundation that perhaps every one of us are standing on right now and don't even realize it's part of our lives. Many of us don't even know or didn't even know this foundation's name until it's recently been brought to our attention through our news feeds or perhaps the nightly news. The foundation has a name, and that name is Structural 
racism. Last week, I shared openly and honestly about feeling convicted to take a public stand against racism and to recognize my part in an unjust system. And so one of the ways that I'm trying to grow as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, is is to read and listen to voices of color. I'm trying to learn about systems that undergird our society that I'm not even aware of because they don't directly affect me. And I'll be the first to admit that this learning process is and continues to be a very painful one. However, this week I've been been very thankful to be a part of the Presbyterian denomination because our denomination has given us some helpful resources to to think and pray about this issue that, that we know that our country is struggling so deeply with right now. And one of the resources that I read was a document focused on dismantling structural racism. And I'd like to share a few important things that I learned. The question's asked, why do we need to talk about structural racism? And the response was, and I quote, Racism is not primarily about individual prejudice or an individual's beliefs and attitudes. Rather, racism in the United States is a socially constructed system. Some people are advantaged and others are disadvantaged merely because of their skin color, ethnic identity, or their ancestral background. Some people are privileged while others are oppressed. And as a consequence, there is unequal and unequable access to resources such as money, education, information, and decision-making power. Unquote. Now, I recognize that's a lot to take in, and I'm going to speculate that some will hear this statement as another example of taking political correctness too far. Others will hear it and already have their minds made up on its validity. Some may truly believe that in this country the color of one's skin doesn't matter because if you are willing to put in the time and the hard work, you are guaranteed a good and successful life. And still there are others who think, this doesn't apply to me, I'm not racist. All these responses, unfortunately, point to the privilege that you and I enjoy. As a white American male, it's hard for me to accept the idea that housing discrimination is a reality. I have always lived exactly where I wanted to live. And I've made the choice whether I bought or rented. People of color often don't have this same choice. I've been blessed to have access to quality education, wonderful job opportunities, and amazing health care. People of color often don't have the same access. I, along with others, have whined a bit lately because the grocery stores don't have everything that I want in stock, but I have never had to live in a food desert. Do you even know what that is? My son Luke educated me about it one night at the dinner table. There are actually identifiable areas in our country that almost always directly affect poor people of color. A food desert is a place... People don't have access to affordable or good quality fresh food. There's plenty of unhealthy fast food, but there is not a single grocery store. Impossible to imagine, right? Yet that's a reality in our country that people are food insecure in this country. You and I know because of the ministry that we share that there is food insecurity in our very community. I could talk about the criminal justice system. I could talk about environmental racism, which I didn't even know was a thing until I started reading. But all these things directly impact communities of color. 
And I think you get the idea by now. Structural racism is a real thing. It's a real problem in the United States. And it's a foundation that many of us stand on and don't even know it because it benefits us. It doesn't hurt us. So what can we do? Well, we can certainly ignore this inconvenient and uncomfortable truth. We can choose to apply a few short-term patches, throw up a black square on our Facebook page, tolerate the preacher while he's focused on racism, call our black friend. We can also decide that it's someone else's problem and not ours. We can refuse to examine our own point of view and justify our choices. Or, or you and I could make the decision to recognize the truth that structural racism is real and seek to listen and learn from those who have suffered because of it. We could acknowledge that that others haven't had the same opportunity that we have been given and seek to be part of the change to dismantle it. We could choose to work for the greater good because we believe that all men and women are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The choice, of course, is each of ours to make. I have to make my choice. You have to make yours. We have to decide if we're going to continue to live on a foundation that is broken or if we're going to do the necessary hard work to start rebuilding it. The good news in all this is we know exactly where to start. We start with Jesus and with his teachings. We look to him for the example of how how we live our lives together in community that's so diverse and yet finds themselves united through him. We build this new foundation through his grace and his love and his mercy and his peace. And we begin to dare to see in one another his reflection and draw strength in the beautiful truth that Paul attests today that that together we are all God's field, that together we are all God's building, and that together God's spirit dwells in our midst. I truly believe that with Jesus as our foundation, we can work towards the healing and unity that this wonderful country desires and needs. To that end, I want to to extend an invitation to each and every one of you. I realize that starting a conversation about racism from this pulpit has made some of you uncomfortable. Please believe me when I tell you that I am just as uncomfortable as you are. However, I'm convinced that now is the time to have this conversation. I have no political agenda. I want that to be crystal clear. I'm just a humble follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm going in the direction that God's Spirit is leading me, and I believe that you're a humble follower of His as well. So rather than letting our differences divide us, as it did the Corinthian community, let's follow Paul's counsel. Let's stand firm on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He's our common ground. We both love Him. And with His help, We can remain together. The invitation is this. Call me. Text me. 
Email me. Let's talk. Let's listen to one another's points of views. Let's learn from each other. And let's never forget that we share a calling that is beyond the division of this world. Together, you and I, we are co-workers in God's service. And I know that what we all desire is for our words and our actions to spread his love and his amazing grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus, and the gift of your Holy Spirit, and the gift of your church. We are, as people, we are facing some very difficult times right now. It, it feels as if we're taking that proverbial one-two punch. We've still don't know what it fully means to live with the coronavirus, and yet now our country is being torn in two, figuratively, literally, emotionally. We need healing. I don't think there's a single person in this world that does not recognize that we need healing. And as Christians, we believe we need you. And so I pray for this country and for this world. I continue to pray for the leaders and the heavy responsibility they shoulder every day. I pray for churches like Cape Carteret Prez, where we are seeking to be faithful in ways that no one taught us how to. I pray for all who, who claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I pray that all of us can find our hope in him. Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways, and, and we are a grateful people. But we need your help, and we need it now. And so we make this prayer and all our prayers in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. And I invite all now in their hearts to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer as Aaron leads us in singing.
please join me in saying at home, amen indeed. I want to take just a moment and recognize the gifts that have been sent online as well as mailed into the church or dropped off as you've been dropping cans of soup off for the Backpack Friends Ministry. And I want to thank you yet again for your continued support of the ministry that we share together. There's a reason that so many years ago God planted a church in Cape Carteret. We're here to worship Him and to serve Him and to share His love and grace in this community. So let's give thanks to Him this, this day by sharing in the doxology. Would you sing it with me? Friends, let us go into this new week encouraged, challenged, but always reminded we are not going into it alone. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the deep abiding peace of God's Spirit go with us this day and every day. Amen. Amen.